This is an armchair, and this is the Book of Life, and these are armchair sermons. Hi, it's time for another uh, armchair sermon. This one I've entitled uh, The Price and the Prize, and the main reading is coming from the Gospel of Mark. It's in uh, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. But um, you might also want to um, put your finger in your Bible on uh, the 23rd Psalm, because we will also be using that pretty extensively. Um, let's begin our reading here. Uh, again, Mark 12, starting with verse 38. As he taught, speaking of Jesus, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets. Well, we haven't changed much in the last 2,000 years, have we? We know people like that. Amen? We may even be people like that. Oops, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I better back off before I start meddling. Um... It's a little too early in the sermon to start meddling. And don't worry, when I do start meddling and stepping on toes, uh, the first toes I step on are mine, because remember, every message that I deliver was first delivered to me. Okay, back to our, our scripture reading. Uh, starting with verse 40 now, speaking of the scribes, they devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers they will receive greater condemnation. Okay, now, here's a confession. Um, and, and please understand that I'm, I'm not telling you this to be boastful. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you this with all humility. When I'm preaching, I write out the corporate prayers in advance. Now, the reason I do that is, uh, is not for length, but I want to uh, be sure that they're complete. I want to be sure that I cover all of the concerns of my congregation. So again, uh, sometimes they get a little long, but that's only because of the needs of the congregation, not because I'm trying to pad them to make them sound better. Uh, see, the difference between these public prayers for others and my personal prayers, which are much different. See, 99% of uh, my personal prayers are quick, one-topic prayers, uh, more akin to uh, post-it notes than to letters. You see, I talk to God a lot. And because I talk to him a lot, um, and I tell him exactly what's on my mind. And, well, I guess my mind just uh, doesn't hold more than one topic at a time. And, <clears throat> pardon me, something strange just popped up on my screen here. Uh, so I'm doing this. As I said, uh, I guess that uh, my mind just doesn't hold a lot of thoughts at uh, one time. And the point is that I, I don't have to get caught up with God when I'm praying because I am caught up with God. Um, I walk with him all the time and he's always there with me. And those prayers that I'm praying daily and constantly are almost always silent. Uh, you could follow me around all day, and you'd never realize when I'm talking to God. And on the other side, if you ever hear one of my public prayers and think to yourself, boy, I wish I could pray like that, well, believe me, you will have missed the point completely. See, public prayers have a place. Uh, Jesus even prayed publicly and said specifically, God, I, I know that you already know what I'm going to say, but I'm saying this for their benefit. So public prayer does have a place, um, but it's not for public entertainment. Prayer is talking to God, and that's all that it is. Now, about these scribes, my, <laughs> my mother had a saying. He almost threw his arm out, patting himself on the back. See, it was her way of saying that uh, someone was just a little too full of themselves. And that seems to describe the scribes that Jesus was talking about. Well, let's not get too smug here. Uh, how many of you have a trophy case? A scrapbook? How about a, a shoebox full of uh, mementos? Things of your past achievements? 
Um, how many of you actually still have your report cards from grade school? Medals, ribbons, awards, certificates, letter jacket letters? See, I think I still have my sharpshooter's badge and my good conduct medal from when I was in the service. Uh, they're in a jar in a drawer someplace. See, we all like to be recognized for what we've accomplished. Especially, we like to be recognized for achieving a goal that we really had to struggle to achieve. And I don't believe that there's anything inherently wrong with accepting the praise of others for our honest achievements. The problem arises when we fail to give God the praise for the strength, the wit, the ability to achieve those goals. I'm reminded of the, uh, the old pioneer who prayed uh, something like this. God, we thank you. I'm reminded of the old pioneer's prayer that went something like this. God, I thank thee for this bread that I baked from the flour that I ground from the wheat that I grew in the field that I planted after I plowed and cleared it of timber and grass and stones. Yes, I thank thee for this bread that I baked in the oven that I built from the stones that I gathered from the field and carried to the house that I built from the lumber that I milled from the trees that I felled in the land that I homesteaded. Now, I'm sorry to say that at times I've had a few too many eyes in my prayer and not enough these and thous. Maybe a more proper prayer for that uh, pioneer would have been, Thank you, gracious God, for this bread which you have provided. Thank you for the seed that you created to grow in your good soil and watered by the rains in their season. Thank you for the health and the strength that you've given me to work the soil. Thank you for the creative mind to conceive and construct my home. Thank you most of all that you loved me enough to send your son to die in my place for my sins. Amen. You see, in our story here, Jesus was trying to show his followers, that's us, that we need to take our eyes off of ourselves and place them firmly on God. And to be sure that his listeners heard the message, he repeats it with another illustration. Now, but before I get into this next part of the reading, I don't want anyone to start squirming in their seats. You see, we're going to be talking about money. And I know that when a preacher starts to talk about money, people start thinking, okay, here it comes. He's trying to get into my wallet. So let me make this clear. I'm not going to pass the plate. I'm not going to take an offering. Uh, if you've got a home church, I encourage you to support them. See, this ministry has very little expenses and does not need your money. But by the same token, I was told by a couple who attended my services back in Iowa that they felt the need to give and that I was being selfish for not allowing them to do so. So, if you feel led to support this ministry, it will be humbly accepted and put to use as God directs. But again, don't hear the following part of this sermon as a plea for money. That is not what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. He was teaching about giving all, not just money, to God. He was teaching about the price and the prize of following him. Okay, now as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Starting with verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. Well, praise God, rich people should put in large sums. Jesus never spoke against that. As a matter of fact, he made it pretty clear that the rich should put the money to its best use here in this life because it wasn't going to follow them into the next. He was quite pointed as to what happens to people who are bad stewards of their assets that they're in charge of. He also praised those who use their resources to gain an increase. See, I believe that God gives us more than we can use for the purpose of giving to others. So listen to what Jesus has to say. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth about a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who were contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, 
but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had all she had to live on now wait a minute all she put in was a couple of coins and those coins were an insignificant portion of the total treasury what difference would these coins make in a treasury so well stocked well that's the point you see Jesus wasn't looking at the good it was going to do the treasury he was looking at the good it was going to do this poor widow wait what did I just say that Jesus was looking at what the widow had just gained yep stay tuned we'll get there in a minute yes she had given all that she had you see Jesus never asked anyone for less than all they have think back to when Jesus called Peter and Andrew and James and John do you remember what happened there it's um, in Matthew 4 starting with verse 18 it says while Jesus was walking along the shore of the Lake Galilee he saw two brothers one was Simon also known as Peter and the other was Andrew they were fishermen and they were casting their net into the lake Jesus said to them follow me and I will teach you how to bring in people instead of fish right then the two brothers dropped their nets and went with him Jesus walked on until he saw James and John the sons of Zebedee they were in a boat with their father mending their nets Jesus asked them to come to him at once they left the boat and their father and went with Jesus do you see he asked everything of them leave your business leave your family leave all of the things that you plan leave it all because there's so much more to gain in Luke 14 26 there's a, a large crowd following Jesus and he had by this time become extremely popular with many people he was he healing them he was feeding them and it appeared that uh, life on the road would, with him would be really good for his disciples and so many followed him then he turned and said to them if you want to be my disciple you must hate everyone else by comparison your father your mother your wife and children brothers and sisters yes even your own life otherwise you cannot be my disciple see there is Jesus disclaimer in this day and age to keep from being sued it seems that everything has a disclaimer on it results may vary consult a physician before proceeding side effects may occur some serious including death uh, Jesus didn't want these fair-weather followers to be unaware of the side effects to become his disciple to become his follower you must be willing to lose everything to own nothing not even your own life and he never promises that it will be easy indeed he says pick up your cross and follow me well in this day and age we're so far removed from the reality of the cross that I think we fail to uh, take in the impact of what Jesus was saying what the those people present we're hearing him say was if you follow me you must be willing to be tortured and executed in the most painful brutal and humiliating way possible if you're looking for sunshine and lollipops uh, where all your dreams come true well don't bother following Jesus he demands all that you own and all that you are and nothing less will do wait so what's in it for me no huh? If I'm going to give up everything, even my will, what will I gain? That seems like a fair question to ask, amen? Well, the psalmist does a, a good job of answering that in the 23rd Psalm. I'm going to pick it apart a little bit here. The Lord is my shepherd. He provides guidance for my life. I shall not want. He provides for all our needs. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. See, he provides rest. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. He provides us with rest in this turbulent world. He leads me beside the still waters. See, he refreshes us. He restores my soul. Our sin-laden soul is cleansed and made new. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. See, he gives us clear instruction and examples of how to live our lives. For his namesake. Remember, we are children of God. We are Christians. We are his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
See, even in death, there is nothing to fear. For you are with me. Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what he said in Matthew 28, 20. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, we actually have the full armor of God. We have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God from Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 18. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Yes, even in the presence of our enemies. Hear what Romans 8, 38 through 39 says. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You anoint my head with oil. Well, there are two different ways of anointing with oil. One is a sign of uh, acceptance and friendship, as when a host would anoint his guests with oil. It was a refreshment from the heat and the dust. The other use of anointing with oil is to sanctify or to make holy, as in anointing the sacrificial altar or the priest or the king. Now, both of these are true for us as Christians. In Romans 8:17, it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. See, my cup runs over. Blessing beyond blessing is ours. More than we can consume, enough to share just like a Three Musketeers bar. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Again, from the 8th chapter of Romans, in the 28th verse we read, And we know that all things work for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Goodness and mercy, even in those times that we don't see them, God is at work turning everything into what is good for us. Sometimes it's ice cream, and sometimes it's cod liver oil, but it's always good for us. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may be where I am. Well, as a follower of Christ, our eternal home is already provided. It's already prepared. The woodwork is polished, the knickknacks are dusted, the bedspread is turned down, and the covers are fully stocked, and the curtains are drawn back. See, home is waiting for us. All of this on the day when we give our life to the Lord. We lost everything, and we gained everything. Paul understood this concept and tried to pass it on to the church at Philippi when he wrote in uh, Philippians 3, starting at verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Okay, I said earlier that it was too soon in the message to start meddling. Well, now we're far enough into it that it is time to start meddling. I want you to think for a moment of what you have gained by knowing Jesus as Lord of your life. And if you don't know um, him as your Savior and your Lord, you come and see me afterwards and I'll pray with you about that. But just think for a moment of what you have gained. See, maybe what you've gained is a better life. Not necessarily an easy life, but a better life than you had or would have had without him. Perhaps uh, what you've gained is a hope beyond this life, the reassurance that where he has gone, you will also go to live with him for eternity. Maybe you've gained victory over an illness or a weakness or an addiction that had held you. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home and never strayed far from the path. So for you, what you've gained is a continuation of that fellowship into the next life. Whatever you have gained is personal and between you and God. But now I want you to think, if you can, of what you have lost by becoming a child of God. Anything of value? Well, speaking for myself here, 
I can't think of anything that I can say that I gave up. Now, uh, there are some things that I no longer do, some places I no longer go, thoughts I no longer have, and emotions that I no longer express. But in truth, whatever was left behind was, as Paul said, rubbish. And interestingly, uh, I have actually heard that the translation closer to the meaning of his words would not be rubbish, but it would be sewage. See, that's what we have found in the Lord, or that's what we have left behind when we found the Lord. Sewage. In exchange, we have gained it all. Praise God. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who has not yet made that commitment to surrender their will to you, that you will speak words of power and reassurance to their hearts right now. And Lord, for all those who already have given their lives to you, we praise you for our salvation, for our strength, for courage, for peace, for our relief, and for our comfort. But most of all, we thank you for your abiding presence in our lives. Amen.